Hello and welcome. It is Tom Stone on the behalf of Indie Structure Productions once again, and we are looking at the full build for Susan Nuss guitar for Cyan Kicks. This is the star shaped guitar. First things first, we need to process all the woods necessary for the build, which means the maple for the maple neck and the mahogany from the mahogany body. I am planing flat the side of the maple board, then cutting out strips on the bandsaw to get three pieces that I'm going to glue up and join. Once I have all the strips, I'm just going to thickness them up on the thicknesser. I'm aiming for about 25 to 25 mil strips that then I can glue together to create a perfect neck blank for me to work from. And I decided to go with a three piece neck just for stability. And it is my preferred method of making necks. For the body, I am very fortunate that I had enough mahogany because it is enormous. It is very wide and so wide in fact that it didn't fit into the thicknesser for me to thickness it. So I had to use this little drum sander. Fortunately, it did the trick. Back onto the thicknesser, it's time to thickness the neck blank into a usable size. Essentially meaning that I just need to make sure it's flat and about 20 mil in thickness. Cutting out the rough shape on the bandsaw for the body. All in all, a very simple process. These are pretty much just straight lines. What you haven't seen was the planning portion that I did with the band. We made sure that we got a nice shape and fixed up anything that we need to fix up. And this is the shape that we finally ended up with. It is based on one of the band's logos, the fox face with the triangle of cyan kicks. To get all those nice straight lines, it's just a matter of using a router with a nice bearing cutter. In order to route the bridge pickup, I had to remove all the excess material with a pillar drill. This gives me the right depth that I'm looking for, but also makes it easier for me to route and not wear down my router bit quite so quick as if I was to hog out a bunch of material at once. And then it's just using a template and a bearing cutter to get the final shape. Frequent viewers might recognize this fretboard from the Pine Guitar Challenge. This was one of the fretboards that I poured resin on to get a good dimension for it for a fretboard blank. It was just the right dimensions for this build and ended up having fairly little epoxy in it. In order to get my fret positions correct, I picked out my favorite book with some good fret charts. And this has a bunch of different scale lengths. For this one, I decided 25 and a half. Just your standard, quote unquote, fendery scale length, which is something that Susana was used to already. It's just a matter of center line with a good protractor, marking out all the fret positions, and then scoring the very same lines with a scalpel blade, making sure to have a nice line to follow with my fretting saw. Now the fretting saw in question was this one at the workshop, and I have to admit, the kerf was a little bit too big for my taste, but it did the job very well. To get the radius on the fretboard, I'm using a radius block with some sandpaper attached. This is a 16 inch radius block, which I found to be a very comfortable radius, and I use it for most of my builds. I decided to go with some white binding on this guitar, just so that it fits the theme a bit better. This entire guitar is going to be white, and it just made sense. So super glue, masking tape, just to pull it all together, and it doesn't require any more force than that. With a little bit of a guide rail, I'm getting the truss rod channel routed just right. Then it's time to glue up the fretboard onto the neck. I'm using two little pins right there. I don't know if you can see them, but they're there to make sure that the fretboard doesn't move or slip during glue up and make sure that everything's nicely lined up. 
and it's always best not to use too much pressure, just in case, you should have a good enough glue joint. Then it's just a matter of trimming everything down. The fretboard is already at the correct taper, so it's just a matter of using the router table and a bearing cutter to get everything to the right taper and dimensions needed. This neck has a rather long tenon on it, and that's mostly just because of how it lines up with the body. You'll see what I mean later. For the back plates, I wanted to utilize the same wood that the body's made out of. I had some excess, so why not use it? It's just a matter of cutting them up on the bandsaw and then flattening them out, getting to the right thickness on the drum sander. Now this neck has a scooped headstock style, so what that means is cutting out some of the excess material on the bandsaw and then using the spindle sander to get the scoop. Then going back onto the bandsaw just to cut out that pointy pointy headstock. I'm fairly surprised by it, but to be very honest, it feels like the perfect headstock shape for such a pointy guitar on the other end as well. It balances it out. And finally, all the final shaping is done on this lovely Triton spindle and belt center. Truss rod access getting drilled carefully so that I don't hit the end of the truss rod and ruin it entirely. Drilling out the tuner holes, fairly straightforward. Everything lines up fairly well because it's a, well, symmetrical headstock. Finally, one of my favorite parts of guitar building, carving the neck. I used a combination of the Shinto saw rasp, a spoke shave, and a bunch of different rasps and sandpapers to get a nice, somewhat, I think, more akin to a C-shaped neck. So I want to get a lot more three-dimensionality out of the body. What that meant was carving down some portions of it to make these chamfers that would then conjoin to the rest of the body. I very quickly decided that this guitar is not going to have any roundovers. Every single roundover that it should have will be a chamfer. The only round thing about it will be the neck carve. Now basically for the neck pocket it's just a matter of repeating the same process that I had for the pickup cavity, except angling the neck pocket to fit that neck at I think it was a couple of degrees. Then it's just a matter of sanding down the entire guitar. I'm working my way up from 120 all the way up to 240 at this point. We're gonna do the fine sanding a little later on once the neck is attached. Speaking of the neck, it's time to prepare for some fretting. Now as I mentioned previously, I will need to glue in the frets. So to that end, I am already going to oil the fretboard at this point because the glue will not stick to the oil. Then with, once again, my favorite protractor, I'm just marking out the side dots. And for the side dots on this guitar, I'm using some Luminlay inlays. This will be very nice on a dark stage, so you can actually see where you're going to be playing. A little bit of super glue, tapping it in with a mallet, and then chopping off the excess with a coping saw. And then fretting. So a little bit of glue, wipe away all the excess with a damp rag, put in the fret wire, and tap in one end, then the other end, and then from the middle outwards. So that entire process again, cut off a piece of fret wire, then for a fret board that is bound, cut off some of the tang. If you don't have fret tang nippers, you can do it this way, cut off some tang, and then with a file, just file everything flat. Remove that ever so slight bit of tang that you couldn't get with your cutters. With all the frets now in place, it's just a matter of filing and sanding everything flush with the side of the fret board. A little bit of a bevel on the edges of the frets, 
and then it is finally time to glue in the neck. I've already done a dry pass at this, which is always a very good idea, just to iron out any sort of kinks you might run into. Nice tight fit. And then just a couple of clamps and a good amount of pressure. Not too much, but just enough to make sure that everything has proper contact with each gluing surface. Then it's time to create the back cavities. I didn't do this previously just because I am cutting into the neck pocket as well. So routing everything out, once again with a bearing cutter, it's the same process as with the pickup. Using a smaller router for the control cavity. So I had some LED strip lying around and a little light bulb moment came on when I wanted to hide a little hidden detail in this guitar. The Cyan Kicks logo with a little switch so you could turn on a light and light it up. But cover it up with paint so it's not obvious if it's not on. And this entire idea came about when I was told what the idea of the song was and I thought that this would be a good representation of a sort of inner light and inner strength that you would find in yourself. Or what I mean is work as a metaphor for such a thing. So to hog out all the material, I'm just using a bunch of different chisels just to make a good cavity for the LED strip to sit in. Then soldering everything together and testing out whether it works. Me and electronics, this could go either way. but. Huzzah, there is light. To cover everything up, I'm using some epoxy with some glow-in-the-dark powder infused in it, which should help diffuse the light a little bit from underneath the paint. Then it's time to drill out all the holes for all the needed wiring. Create the back plates. And as a side note, I am so happy with how well these back plates fit. I mean, look at that. Then drilling all the holes for the back plates and the screws keeping them in place. I am trying to think of whether I would replace screws in upcoming builds with magnets because that would be, well, frankly, pretty cool. But I don't know if that would have fit here because there's quite a lot of batteries in that cavity. So batteries, magnets, I decided not to risk it. And then finally, final sanding and preparation for painting. Now I'm going through all the grids going back to 240, then building up to about 400 grit. Just to make sure that I get all the scratches out and everything nice and smooth in preparation for paint. This was also the chance that I took to create the headstock inlay, so the IP logo. getting it in place, marking it out with a scalpel blade, and then just excavating all the excess material. With all that said and done, it's time to prepare for the spray booth. I've already done one primer layer, as you can see here. And it's just a matter of me using some wet sanding techniques to scuff down and flat sand the paint layers as I go. 
So we're removing the masking tape off of the logo just to get some paint on there to hide it a little better. Now to take a look at how the usual paint process goes. I will start with the sides of the guitar first, moving constantly throughout and never starting on the guitar itself. Always starting off the guitar and moving into the surface. Then the front, making sure that each subsequent layer passes through halfway of the previous pass just to get better coverage. And what I'm using here is some Maston sprays. I like Maston sprays because A, they're easy to find, they are somewhat cheap, um, but not cheap in quality, cheap as in price-wise. But they do have a nice fan that you can control. You can change the fan direction, which makes spraying that much easier. And they go on rather thin, so they're very easy to control. So, with all the painting done, it's time to prepare for some clear coats. Now to do that, there's a little bit of a lip between the paint and the binding. So I'm just using a scalpel blade just to clean that up ever so slightly and make sure that my white binding really is white binding. I have to say, one of the hardest and most difficult colors to work with whenever painting something is white. Not to mention high gloss white, which is exactly what I'm working with here. They are very nitpicky, but just take your time and make sure you do things properly and keep things clean and you'll get there, hopefully. Practice makes perfect. So clear coats going on exactly the same way as I put on the paint. After that is done, it's time to polish her up. So I'm just using some Auto Glim car polish, which works great because it polishes up the surface to a very, very high gloss, but also protects the wood and protects the paint which, you know, comes crucial when you're making something for a rock band, which is prone to uh, get some dents and nicks into the wood. But hey, that's a part of the process. Clearing out the space for the nut and cutting the nut itself. I am using some Corian, which is my substitute for bone nuts because I don't really like to use bone all that much. Uh, Corian is, well, it's a composite material, usually used for kitchen tabletops or work surfaces. So it's very hard material and works very well. And, you know, tonality wise, it works pretty much the same way as a bone nut. To get the nut dimensions correct, I'm using a half cut pencil on top of the frets just to get the bottom of the nut slots figured out. And then a scalpel blade to cut out little nicks on both sides just to get the width of the nut completely correct. Flattening it out on a leveling beam and then cutting out the actual shape of the nut with a little bit excess just so I can file that away. Using a nice file, a single cut file to shape the nut into a better shape. Get both edges and get the curve, the radius correct. And then marking out the nut slots with this string spacing rule. A very, very handy tool which gives you the correct string spacing depending on where you've placed your outermost strings. So what I like to do is for the bass side, I will have the bass string sitting four millimeters set in from the side of the nut, and then the treble string three and a half mil set in from the side of the nut. Once I have all the nut slots marked out, I just used a nut slotting file of different gauges to cut out, well, the different gauge nut slots. Then sanding everything nice and round. You don't want to have any sharp edges on a nut. And I believe, and I firmly believe this, that a good, well-made nut makes a hell of a difference and is the mark of a well-made guitar. So, logo got put in place and then it's about time to polish up them frets. I'm just using a bunch of different fret polishing abrasives to get this job done. Fairly simple process. Although, you know, it does make my hands cramp every now and then. Oiling up the fretboard with some fretboard conditioner because you need to keep your fretboards in nice condition. Keep them conditioned, moisturized, meaning oiled up, and they'll last you a very long time without cracking. So, making sure that I get my scale length in the correct place, which means making sure that I get my bridge in the correct place. So I marked out where my scale length belongs 
and now I'm figuring out the center line and marking things out on a piece of masking tape just so I get complete good placement on everything. Making sure that my saddles are the correct height and here we go. Time to drill in the bridge ground. Tuners getting put in place, and I gotta say, I love these Schaller M6 locking tuners. They are so great. I love the gears, how they work, and the locking system seems very, very reliable. I haven't had any issues with them yet, and I continue to use them on all of my builds. These are direct mounted pickups. So what you don't see is that I have some threaded inserts in the body already, and I just, you know, screwed the pickup straight into the body. The reason why I like to do this is just to get the best resonance going straight into the pickup without it being suspended from a pickup surround or a pick guard or something like that. All the resonance is going straight into the body through the woods and through the pickup. Strings in place and uh, a little retainer bar is much called for because this is a scooped headstock and I hate string trees. Bar retainers aren't that great looking either, but they are a hell of a lot better than, well, string trees all over the place. Then tuning it up, making sure the intonation is perfect, and we are ready to see Susanna's reaction for the first time seeing this guitar live. Let's check it out. So Suna picked up this guitar and took it. it straight into the music video shoots, which you will see here. And in the final music video, I mean, this is this is just such a cool moment for me. And wow, I was exhilarated. But the guitar was not done. Some final bits to go. So finishing up all the fret work, and we need to make this guitar play much better than it was. Well, for a playback music video. So, finishing up the fret work, which is the easy part, considering that the next part that we have to do is inlaying a bunch of crystals. Yes, you heard me right, inlaying some crystals. There's gonna be many of these. So, we'll get into it very soon. So I leveled out the frets and getting ready to crown the frets, but before that, we're gonna do a little bit of fall away. So this is just to add a little bit of ease into the playing on the higher frets up on the fretboard. There's a little bit of a ramp on the three to four last frets. With the fret rocker, I'm just making sure that everything is nice and flat before moving on to fret crowning. And fret crowning will finally determine the actual intonation points of each fret. So as the frets have now been sanded pretty much flat on the top, a fret crowning process will make sure that that large flat area will turn into a very thin area, making sure the intonation point is at the very center of the frets. It is crucial in order to get the instrument playing properly. Then rounding off the fret ends, and finally moving on to the entire polishing process all over again. So sanding away all those file marks, sanding marks, and then going back with all the abrasive rubbers just to get everything nice and polished up, oiling up the fretboard, and then planning out the crystals. So Susan I came back to plan out what kind of pattern she would like for the crystals to be in. <laughs> <laughs> and then I transferred that over into, well, lots of math, lots of angles, and a lot of measuring to make sure that everything is nicely symmetrical.
and then it's a matter of just cutting out all the edges just so I don't flake off all the paint because that would be a royal pain. So I just score the wood and the paint ever so slightly. Then I use my multi-tool with a little router base to cut everything to the right depth. Then going back to the spray room because I don't want any of that mahogany to show through I do need to paint these white and as you can see here the logo is a little bit too prominent so I want to hide that while I'm at it as well so a little more paint and a little more clear coats just to get everything looking just the way I want it to Polishing her up, same process before, some auto glim and a lot of hand buffing. Now going back and redoing some parts was also crucial in getting feedback from the band about and getting feedback from Susana about how she would want to change some aspects of the guitar. What also needed to be changed was the strap locations. So. The upper horn strap location didn't really work, so we moved it a little bit, and now it works much better and has a much better balance to the guitar. And yeah, the crystal part, that was just an added detail that we wanted to go with. So that's about 67 crystals, I believe, inlaid into the guitar. And no, these are not real crystals. They are uh, some form of plastic, I believe. But we tried to find ones that wouldn't fade, and ones that would look good for a long time to come. And this was the result. It took a lot of doing, but I believe that the end result really paid off really well. Feeding the electronics through and putting everything back together again. Then final setup, intonation, and making sure that the guitar really does play as good as promised. And here you can see that the strap location has changed ever so slightly, and it is a lot more comfortable to play, I have to admit. So I'm very happy that I decided to actually move that, for sure. And here's some sounds that we haven't heard before from this guitar. It is equipped with a Seymour Duncan JB, by the way, and as Seymour Duncan JBs go, they, they are great pickups, they sound great, and yeah. Also good to hear that the uh, electronics of the light do not interfere with the sounds of the pickup at all.
and no build is finished without a certificate of authenticity with my signature on it. I am really pleased with this instrument. It was a hell of a challenge and very different to anything I've done before. So I really hope you have enjoyed this video and I hope that you will like and comment down below. Let me know what you think about this guitar and be sure to subscribe, hit the little bell because those things help the channel out immensely. So here, some reactions from the band on seeing the final product. Finally. Thank you very much for watching and see you guys in the next video. Bye bye. Eiköhän vielä peli studiolle ja... Mm-hmm.